I believe that water will one day be employed as a fuel. That hydrogen and oxygen, which constitute it, used singly or together, will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light, of an intensity of which coal is not capable. I believe then that when the deposits of coal are exhausted, we shall heat and warm ourselves with water. Water will be the coal of the future. Energy is the central commodity of global civilization. Without huge energy resources to supply the growing needs of humanity, economic and social progress would stagnate, and the world would plunge into a new dark age. Today, we expend the equivalent of 2,000 barrels of oil per second, and this is growing, especially in developing nations. In the late 20th century, wars have been fought over the control of oil buried beneath shifting desert sands, and this source of energy will one day run out, though perhaps long after irreversible environmental damage has been done. New clean energy sources are sorely needed to replace polluting fossil fuels. Many say that all the peoples of the world especially in the industrialized nations, need to scale back their energy consumption, ending their hopes for a brighter future. Others say our salvation lies in renewables, such as solar and wind power. However, the limitations of these passive energy systems, with their dependence on favorable weather conditions and locations, preclude them from being the ultimate energy solution. Yet what if there were an ultimate solution of virtually infinite clean energy from a substance almost no one had previously suspected? The very water that covers 70% of the surface of our planet and gives life to all biological systems. And what if such a simple invention was already in existence, producing power safely and cleanly? In 1989, the prospect of a water fuel age foretold by Jules Verne over a century ago came into sharp focus with the announcement of a startling discovery at the University of Utah. Two respected chemists, Dr. Martin Fleischmann and Dr. Stanley Pons, announced that they had achieved the unthinkable, an inexhaustible source of energy that they could demonstrate with a simple electrochemical cell. And basically, we've established a sustained nuclear fusion reaction by means, uh, by means which are considerably simpler uh, than conventional techniques. They claimed that they had discovered a heretofore unknown nuclear-like reaction that would make water a powerful fuel for the future. It became known as cold fusion because it apparently delivered fusion energy like that produced in the sun or by hydrogen bombs. Yet not at millions of degrees, but much closer to room temperatures. Moreover, it emitted no deadly radiation. Ironically, the press conference came less than 12 hours before the Exxon Valdez ran aground off the coast of Alaska, spilling millions of gallons of oil into pristine waters. It is now a decade later, with a world so desperate for new sources of clean energy, 
What happened to the promise of cold fusion? It was a big story then, making headlines around the world. But all of a sudden, it died out, and we were told that it was just another false promise. Was cold fusion too good to be true? A mistake by overzealous scientists? Or is it a real phenomenon, just not easily understood? And if so, why haven't we heard much about it since then? In this program, you will see that the field, although small, is still very much alive with working devices that seem to defy conventional physics and chemistry. Scientists and technologists all over the world are putting the pieces of the puzzle together in an international effort to determine what is taking place in cold fusion cells and how to engineer that into commercial applications. Is it just wishful thinking, or are we about to witness the coming of a new energy revolution as we uncover the secrets of making fire from water? This is the, the apparatus. And very simply, when positively charged deuterons are attracted to the palladium cathode, they cram together, and there are millions and millions of them inside the cathode, getting closer and closer, and then they, they fuse. And they create energy in the form of helium. But how do we know it works? Because it's there, it's in nature, the raw, natural power just waiting to be harnessed. And when we ignite that cold fusion fire. I mean, just imagine. There's more energy in one cubic mile of seawater than in all the known oil reserves on Earth. I mean, you could drive your car 55 million miles on a gallon of heavy water. Maybe the end of pollution, warmth for the whole world. Hollywood movies often exaggerate reality in order to tell a compelling story that will entertain and enthrall. Yet Hollywood's best writers could hardly dream up a more dramatic tale than the true story which began with Fleischmann and Pons and is still unfolding as one of the most intense controversies in the history of science. Fusion is a process that releases huge amounts of energy when two atomic nuclei, usually hydrogen isotopes, collide and fuse together. Theoretically, this can occur only at extreme temperatures. For decades, scientists at Princeton, MIT, and other institutions have been pouring billions of government dollars into building plasma fusion reactors, magnetically ringed vessels called tokamaks that could contain this hot fusion reaction. Their goal, to bring the nuclear fire of the sun down to Earth using the hydrogen in water as fuel. Although much has been learned in the quest for controlled fusion, success has been elusive. And the promise of hot fusion remains as distant as ever. To date, not one extra watt of power beyond the electrical power fed in has ever been generated. 